Thank you all for showing up to this. I always hate to have an empty room in order to give a presentation. Well, my name is Nick Morales. I worked at the university for over 35 years, so I'm retired from the university. My primary field of study was geology, but I did computing instead. So I had a natural talent for that. Back in the days when we had a single mainframe computer for the entire university. I was manager of operations for a great number of years. Nonetheless, my story of myself is a very delicate, intricate one. So I'm going to relate that to you. I was born and raised in McAllen. And then after high school, unfortunately, I had to move away to go to college. So I moved to Edinburgh. <laughs> Got my education there, and unfortunately for, fortunately for me, I found my application, and that was working with the uh, university throughout my career. But I never gave up my geology studies. I became a mentor, a club uh, sponsor for the geology club throughout the years. I went on their field trips. I actually wrote a, a paper, a geology paper, on one of the areas we were studying. I edited and, and helped draw, draft pictures and diagrams for the other publications that the geology department did. After I retired, I started looking for something to do. And I came across like-minded individuals who like to go out to the rocks and go look for rocks, and specifically look for artifacts. And I became associated with them, and that became now my passion that I've been working with, I suppose, for the last eight, seven, eight years. Now I collect, I document, I study, I analyze, and I help write papers dealing with articles that are found down in South Texas, which are published in the Journal of Southern, South Texas Archaeological uh, Society. So. That being said, I will try to limit the term I, because collecting is a universal thing. And I don't want to sound like one of those Mexican mariachi bands. I, 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 I. <laughs> Nonetheless. So I see a lot of individuals that I do remember uh, from uh, previous uh, programs or some of the ones that I've been associated with the mission um, Palm Valley, or Palm Valley Geology Club. Um, so I am going to go and start with, my presentation deals with the geology of South Texas and how it influenced the production of tools that were used by the natives in this area. And oh, let me digress a little bit. I try not to use the term Indian. That has become synonymous with maybe a little bit of discomfort to certain people. Now, my geolog or, uh, in my genealogy, I have about 42% Native American, what they call uh, the southern region. But I also have 47% Iberian Peninsula. So somewhere between the conquest and now, that's how I became. <laughs> Nonetheless, I will try, and this is very hard for me to do. Every, over the years, I have not been able to rid that one word from my vocabulary. I will try to use the ancients, those that lived here before recorded time. And I may sometimes say the ancient peoples, but then that's also kind of redundant. And I even used uh, redundancy here. Ancient history, by its very term, that's redundant. Okay. And one of the ways I want to present the program is to give a background in not only archaeology, but also geology and anthropology. So you'll have to bear with me when I go through those slides, and I'll try to go through as fast as I can. Most of you are aware of that, but some of you may not. Okay. These are some of the points that have been found in South Texas. Alibet, some of the prettier ones. And I stole this picture from the CHAPS program in, in, uh, at the university. I'll, I'll talk about that in a little bit, too. 
Let's go about looking at how or what the geology of South Texas is and how it influenced what things were made out of. And there you have this yellow area here, which is alluvial material. It's material that's been brought down by the river, so the Rio Grande River, but also from the Pecos River up here by the San Juan River on this side, the Rio Salado on that side. All of these have been washed down primarily during storm periods when high volumes of water can move massive rocks in the bed and then deposit them on shore, which you might know as caliche pits now. Next, we have this kind of brownish area here, and this is a layer of rock. If you think about layers of rock, there would be one layer on top of the other. But if the layers are tilted a little bit because of the actions of the earth, the surface then gets a larger exposure of that rock surface that you can see. So you're actually walking on this rock unit, and it's not really a rock unit, sorry. This is a sand and silt <coughs> and gravel unit. There are no rocks over here. No rocks of this age here. Following that, oh, and if you follow down, this is three million year old sediments. And the Pleistocene, Holocene fill here is about 20,000 years present. So this is very young. This is older rocks. The next layer, this white one called the Lizzie, is 23 to 3 million years old, followed by this layer here, which is 30 to 23 point million years. And finally, back over here where Falcon Lake is, is the Jackson Formation of Wilcox Clybourne of 49 to 30 million years old. And you think, just think about how old that is. Because as a student of geology and, and, and as a practicing pseudo-geologist in the area, I was brought many rocks, like this one. I found this one. I, 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 I. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> this one was found uh, near the Tigre Chico River in Zapata. And is it a dinosaur egg? And you can't imagine how many people have brought these nice little round, beautifully sculptured, perfectly smooth rocks and said, I found a dinosaur egg. Well, let's go back to this. These are all, are almost always found in this area, this area, or even in uh, the Rio Grande area. How old are they? 49 millions or younger. There were no dinosaurs during this period. The dinosaurs died out 65 or 66 million years ago. Anytime you find a rock nice rounded, it's going to be a sandstone concretion or some other subterranean nodule. Just, just for your edification. Okay. What are the rocks that are available here? And by that, I mean the lithic, lithic stone, the lithic material. Gravel pits are probably one of the most common sources of lithic material that was available to the ancients in order for them to make the tools that they needed in day-to-day -day existence. And it's not just arrowheads that you might think about. There's a whole variety of different other tools that I want to cover in this program. The reason for that is most people aren't aware of these. And if you're out hunting rocks or looking on your properties and you find this rock there and you go, oh, it's just a broken rock, throw it away. You might be actually throwing away an artifact. So the gravels are everywhere, all the way from Zapata, down through Mission and even into La Jolla. Down in La Jolla, they're buried underneath the, the sediment, but they can be dug up and used. And if you're right along the river, you will find these. And along the small little channels that go into the river, you will find the gravel. And that's where the ancients found these. And they would pick through them and find just the right one that had the consistency and the malleability to be able to be broken and then reused as a tool. Napped, cut, flint. Over on the well, over on the other side is a mound of chert 
a naturally occurring mound that's northwest of Rio Grande City. And this church has give, been given a name called the El South Church because it is, though not near El South, it's close to it. And this is a very identifiable material, and I'll show you a piece of the El, El South shirt over there after the presentation. This was a source of material for, for the use of tools, or for the production of tools. And our two uh, resident geologists from the university here. Let's go back and review where all this material might have come from, or and probably did. Rio Grande, we're down here, and the Pecos River is, is a, was a source of rocks from the mountains in this area. The Rio Grande was a source of rocks from here, from the Big Bend area, the volcanics of the Big Bend area, and in Mexico from this area, as well as the mountain range Sierra Madre Occidental in Mexico. These rivers here are probably the biggest contribution, contributors to a different type of sediment of rocks than you would normally find on the south side of South Texas. They're very, very unique. Some of them are yellow, some of them are banded colors, and they're limestones, where limestones would not have, yeah, these buttons are far too close together. <coughs> Limestones are far, this is too long a distance for a limestone to be transported, ground up, and then survive. So the, the idea is we'll concentrate a little bit of the rocks that came from here and some of the ones, of course, that have come from further. If I go to a gravel pit or a road cut and look at the color of the rocks, the distribution of the rocks, I can usually tell you where they might have come from. And remember, I say might, because even though you are in a gravel pit, that is a mixture of everything that's come down over and over, recycled, removed, and finally deposited someplace. Here are some of the lithic stones that are used or have been used. Am I blocking your view? Okay. All right. We have. We have quartz. Quartz and quartz rocks are the most abundant and the easiest and most commonly used rock type for the production of lithic tools in South Texas. And there are a, quite a variety of names, such, a, such as chert, agate, chalcedony, flint, jasper, even petrified wood and petrified palm. But there are a range of so many other things. There's there are uh, jaspers that I think, yeah, jaspers. There are carmelians. Uh, the range of colors and the range of textures have different rock names that are assigned by the people who like to hunt rocks and try to identify something different: agates, banded agates, mossy agates, black agates, all sorts of names. But they're all quartz related. Next are the igneous rocks. And going back to your college or even earlier study of rock types, an igneous rock is one that was formed from a molten state and cooled at a slow rate in the earth. After that, that earth was shoved up by diatomic forces, not di uh, tectonic forces up to the surface, weathered away, broken down, and then flooded down the river. And these include rhyolite, which is a uh, next ex, uh, extrusive igneous rock, basalt, which is somewhere in between, day size getting closer, and then finally the granites. And you find granites, and I have found granite artifacts. And I found pieces of granite and other rocks. It's amazing if you just walk around the type and material that you find. Next are the sedimentary rocks. These are sandstone, siltstones, and limestones. You do find sandstone up in Zapata and, and Roma uh, area, specifically the Roma sandstone. It's a big bluff right there at, at Roma. They were used for building. 
but they were, all, they were also used for metates, for molcajetes. The metamorphic rocks are those generally are formed by heat and pressure deep in the interior earth. Again, those were pushed up to the surface, ground down, broken apart, and transported into the river. So let's look at some of the examples. This is agate. It's a colorful agate with bands on it. Chert. Chert is generally a gray to a light, lightish gray color. Very easy to identify. Petrified wood. Well, most of you have seen petrified wood. How many haven't seen a petrified piece of wood? Huh? See? Everyone. Okay. And then occasionally petrified palm and artifacts made out of petrified palm. Well, these are rare, but they still can be found. Over here is a rhyolite, and you can see there's a completely different coloration, texture. And I bring this in because the next slide tells you about non-lithic tools. What are they? Bone, teeth, antlers, wood, shells, both freshwater and saltwater, and even iron. Well, you might say, well, wait a minute. I didn't know that the, in, uh, yeah, see, the ancients had an iron culture, and they didn't until the Spanish came in with their armor. And they cut those up and used, them, used their arrowheads made out of that iron, iron from, from the armor and other, uh, and other materials. Uh, my thoughts are that few iron pieces survive the weathering as well as, if you look down here, almost all of these do not survive because the environment of South Texas, the dry, the occasional water, the evaporation, the rodents, the animals that eat that much bone antler, they devour all that. Only in cases where things have been buried and preserved can we actually find some of those. I was, it was fortunate that while, I was, while stumbling around in the the desert or the brush country, came across this piece of bone. I don't know if it's a tool or not, but it certainly has some shape to it. Unfortunately, it was broken, so I can't tell what it was. I still labeled it and put it in my collection. Okay, I'm going to stop here. If you have any questions about the rocks that were used by the ancients? Wow, everyone's well familiar with that. Well, I want to bring one out and have you make an arrowhead. <laughs> so, now the, the lecture part of this thing. Anthropology. This is a study of human beings, even through their ancient history, and how they, they were infected by their environment and their social and, and cultural life. So I want to key in on the South Texas and the Northern Mexico region that's the area. I don't like traveling too far. I want to give you a little bit of the regional history, the prehistory to the present, as far back as we can, as archaeologists, anthropologists, geologists can trace human life in this area, and uh, which then goes into the climatic conditions where these ancients lived and how they lived. We'll start with a satellite picture of where we are. Okay, there's Reynosa and McAllen right in here, Edinburgh. Gulf is down in here, Mount Metamoros. But let's go back. Does everyone know that there used to be another town called Reynosa? Old Reynosa da Diaz. Where the town of Diaz or Daz is, was, that was the original site of the town Reynosa. During a flood, those individuals, smart that they were, decided, hey, let's go someplace where it's a little bit higher ground. And they came down here. Okay. And if you ever go and look across the river from Roma to, the, to that area, you can see that's right at the base of the river. Any large floods is going to wipe that whole area out. Luckily, we have Falcon Dam that can mitigate some of these uh, disasters, which gives me an interesting story. I've often wondered the logic with the Corps of Engineers, the United States Corps of Engineers. You know, they build dams on river to prevent floods downstream. 
but the, in, their, in their true form, they flood the upstream. One or two of the others, right? You either flood the upstream or you, or you flood them downstream. Okay, now I want to point out a few more items. Sal del Rey over here. Does everyone know what Sal del Rey and the salt lakes of South Texas are? If you don't, you should become a little uh, acquainted with those. Kind of a neat area. You can't, well, you can go into one of them. It's a wildlife uh, refuge. You can walk around, but don't pick up anything. That is strictly illegal. Okay? But it's a beautiful area. It's full of salt. And uh, that's an, a whole new presentation in itself. Rio Grande City, Camargo. <clears throat> Near there is the Rio San Juan Sugar Lake, or as it's actually called Presa Marti Gomez. And this brings water as well as sediment from the, uh, the mountains here in western, northwest, northeastern Mexico. Falcon and the Rio Salada, which is another large gateway, pathway for migration of these uh, ancients. So is the Rio Salado. So are a few little tributaries that just come in this way and some few, very few that come in this way. But no tributaries down here. There are no rivers, no tributaries, very few lakes, except for the salt ones. So how did people live when they didn't have any, have any water? Especially up here. There's no water, there's no rivers, there's no nothing. These, this was a barrier to the migration north and south to the localized uh, groups that live down here. Mind you, they did travel, but only during climatic conditions favorable to them, such as after big storms, when these hollows that are caused by wind, deflation zones, get filled with water. They become a mecca for animals and for hunting and for surviving. And they would travel along these routes back and forth only when conditions were favorable. That doesn't mean that right now it's not favorable. It's probably not as favorable as always. Prior to 500 years ago, we had a different climate. There was more water, there was more, more game, more uh, uh, vegetation. So as the climate changes, the nomadic character of these individuals became more, more prolific. So remember these places, Sal del Rey, Rio San Juan, and Rio Salado. Does anyone know what Rio Salado means? Salty, salty water. Well, if we have salty water up here, there's no reason to believe why we would have salt over here too. One of these lakes, Sal del Rey, what does that mean? Salt the salt of the king, because salt is a mineral resource, and anything that was discovered in the New World became the property of the king. Human habitation in this, in this region. Prior to the year 2000, it was generally accepted that the Clovis culture, and this is derived from a name of a particular projectile point, very unique, very distinguishable from all the others. And that could have been up to 13,000 years ago. So people have been here for a very long time. More recently, in North Texas, at a site called Galt, um, um, dig or, or excavation, there have been suggested that the populations have been here for at least 16,000 years. It's kind of interesting because you would probably have a culture here before they developed projectile points. They would have rocks that they could throw at animals. They would have spears without projectile points. But none of that is truly or often Preserved. Where is the Gulf? It is uh, just south of Fort Worth. And so the evidence of the habitation in South Texas and northern Mexico may be as old as 
16 or 13,000 years old. Questions? So the Clovis is a, <clears throat> that's a culture? That's yes, it's called the Clovis culture. The Folsom culture is another one of the pre, the earliest groups of humans that lived not only here, but actually around the world that had the same type of, of projectile um, characteristic. So how far did the Clovis go in the States? I think of Clovis, New Mexico. Yeah, well, that's exactly where the first one was discovered. Okay. Now, the Clovis can be found all the way up to the northern part of the United States, up into Canada, and even into further Mexico. Without, although that, the Clovis points are not found in abundance in Mexico, but they are found. So that may be the furthest extension. Okay. Archaeology and anthropology. The need to preserve what you find is very important. You pick up a tool or an arrowhead and throw it in your pocket and then get home and throw it in a closet. Whatever history that one stone left behind is gone. So I'd like to stress that it is important that if you're out looking for rocks or even if you're looking for projectile points or artifacts, try to record where you find them. Put them in a Ziploc bag, put a name on it, put a date and location, because when you're gone, somebody else is going to look at it. Say, hey, this guy found it in this area. And researchers like myself, we like to view other collections for unusual or correlating information, which is something I do. I'll go out and, and photograph individuals' collections of points and, and, uh, and artifacts, give copies to the, to the university, to themselves, and to other, other uh, uh, educators in the area that are interested in what has been found in the area. We do not, as part of the Texas law, you. What you find on your property is yours. It cannot be taken away from you. So, okay. Let's start with the climate now of South Texas. We'll start back 25,000 years ago when an, a, a, an area called, or a time called the uh, lar last glacial maximum. That's when the ice sheets and the glaciers in the north came down as far as the middle part of the United States. And then during their retreat, when the, melt, the, the water started melting, it caused major floods and major rainfall. When the ice was present, the coastline of the Gulf was not where it is today. If you go and stand by the water at Padre Island, think about well, what was the shoreline like 25,000 years ago? It was 15, 20 miles away from you, to the east. And any habitations that may have existed on those fish or survived on that type of environment would now be buried because the ocean came back up when the ice melted, dumped all that water back into the oceans, and the water level came up. Yes. Sorry? Wasn't the original coast by Rio Grande Roma? Tell me how you can find some of those. The, the coast? Well, that's a good and very interesting point because 25 million years ago, the coastline was in Roma. 30 million years ago, the coastline was over in Zapata. I'm talking about the last 25,000 years, okay? Because that's the most calm or the most present area and it's actually the the period between 20 and 10,000 years ago that is the pluvial period during the time when the glaciers melted lots of rain lots of flooding lots of very large rock was moved down the river the canyons were carved the gravels pits were were made were deposited the trees were knocked down that were living there, buried, and became petrified wood. As the water flowed away from the glaciers, 
sea level rose to this present state now. Many of the coastal habitated areas were flooded. Thus, we have, we have had a very large variation in climate, and by that token, we had a very large variation in the flora and the fauna that lived here. From the mega animals, such as mastodon, bison, large cats, bears, all of that was prime hunting material for the ancients. And they moved with these herds, or they moved wherever they, they needed to, to be able to su survive. Then we'll talk very little on the last, actually most of this is, rest, is in the last 500 years of the Spanish um, colonization and then the, uh, the European colonization as well. I've always asked, well, how many people li peoples lived here? The answer is no one can really tell. But there had to have been substantial number. During periods of good hunting, good weather, there were probably a great deal more. During periods of drought, subsistence, populations probably diminished. I was once uh, given this little story about a person who had asked, when we were out looking for arrowheads, well, how many arrowheads do you think are out here, out in, the, in this area? And the little story goes like this. Well, do you think about one native that was here that would lose one arrowhead, just one, in an acre, in, in, in a month, just one every month? How many acres are in South Texas and Northern Mexico? Millions. How many years have they been here? 10,000 years. There used to be a huge amount of artifacts. A lot of them have been picked over, but not, not all of them. That's something to think about. Now we'll talk about the actual individuals that lived here. In, um, in 1891, uh, J.D. Powell coined the term Coahuilatecans for the state of Coahuila in Mexico. And it is simply a consolidation of linguistically similar languages. And it was okay to do that during that time because no one really had a good idea of who was here. Later on, I'll, I'll, let's go ahead. The amalgamation included parts of Coahuila, Mexico, and most of South Texas, all the way to San Antonio. It also was from the Gulf Coast and oh, eastward to the, to the headwaters of the Nueces River. In 52, John Swenson was able to identify 224 individual names of individual groups. Now, I won't say a tribe. None of these were really associated as one tribe. They were groups whether they were family groups, whether they were groups of convenience, of protection, of subsistence, or just friends. They were groups. They were not, they were not tribes. So there were 24 different, 224 names of tribes. And in 56, a new term of the Western Gulf cultures was developed. And now there's even more subdivisions of that the Gulf Coast Coaster. Okay, let's look at this map again. Remember we saw this first one? Hope all of you were paying attention. There will be a test. <laughs> okay, where did these groups survive? Well, along the Gulf Coast were some Indians called the Alapaque and some called the Saulape Kemos. Now, these were true Indian names, but even I have a hard time pronouncing them. So the Spanish had a little trick. They gave them their own names, such as the Come Crudos, Mulatos. Does anyone know what Come Crudos means? Yeah. The Spanish, when they saw them, noticed that these guys did not cook anything. They ate everything raw, whether it was meat, fish, uh, uh, plant life, they didn't cook. 
So logical, hey, they just call them come, come crudos. And it's also interesting that come crudos were found in the Gulf, which are called the come crudos of the Gulf. There were come crudos of the, no, I'm not, I don't have them here, I think, but the, of the uh, western Rio Grande. So they, they were actually found in multiple locations at different times. Here in the center were the cacalotes. Anyone know what a cacalote is? That's a good one. Hmm? No. A cacahuate is a peanut. That's a crow. So why did the Spanish name them crows? We don't know, but it's good to conjecture that maybe those Indians wore crow feathers or crows followed them around for some reason. Or they were colored as crows might be, a dark color. Who knows? But you can say that they used names like that that were easy for them to remember just by looking at them. Other names were like the pintos. They were painted with either dye or 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 or, or a, a soil color, coloration, a hematite, a red oxide. They were painted, could have been tattoos, could have been tattooed. Uh, there's also some called garzas. They were probably found near the cranes, the river cranes, which another one would be the carizos. Carizo is a that grass that grows along the, the river. My point is, the Indian, a lot of the Indian names were lost. Subsequent work has brought back some of those. Unfortunately, there were so many different spellings that it's often hard to, 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 to put them together and to know that this is one group. But we'll go on. Over here in Sal del Rey, there were also cacalotes up there and also the comonames. There was another group called Como se llaman. What are their names? <laughs> Here's another one. Anda de caminos. They walked on trails. Tortugas. Over here by Camargo. That's a, a land tortoise. Now the, my point is, there were quite a number of different groups, and they moved around. The Spanish would list them in their church records, in their baptisms, in their birth records, but only by their own, by whatever name they chose to, to, to give them. And there are records of groups as many as 300 living near churches or forts. So that's how many were here. One of the items that I've been able to compile, because the, the documents, the literature, just has a name and a time period. Well, if you want to know what Indian or what groups lived in certain areas, there was no record that I could easily go to. So I set about making a, a spreadsheet which gave a time, which gave a time period from the 1530s all the way to the 1800s. And I would, this is a list of all the tribal names, not tribal, the group names that I've been able to find and the location that they were seen or recorded. So with one click of a find, I could say, well, I want to know who inhabited Sal del Rey and when. Well, that program directly goes to the Sal del Rey and come over and say, oh, these guys lived here during this period of time. And then you'll notice they're blank areas because there's nothing recorded about them during that time. So it made it easy for me to say, well, I want to know where the cacalotes were found and, and come down to that line and go across what year they were found there and what areas they, they, uh, they, they could have been found or they were found or recorded. It's just a a way of making it easier. These are some of the references that I used for that chart. Can you put that into an interactive map? No. Okay. I've been thinking about that for quite a while. <laughs> mm -hmm. Archaeological record. What you find is important. So you have to at least think about it in a scientific method or approach. You 
carefully collect what you find, you document, you analyze, and if you want to, you can start reporting about what you find, and then preserve it. Don't just leave it to your, your relatives to know what to do after you die. You can donate it to the local universities or the colleges for their use in the future. Think about that. And the law. You cannot collect in state parks, and you cannot collect in federal land. And I do this very specifically because Falcon Lake is federal property. If you go out and collect along Falcon Lake, be very careful. That's against the law. Again, you, uh, you start off with a, a plan. Well, I'm going to go to this ranch or to my ranch. Well, where is it geographically? Is it near water? Is it not? Is it on a high bluff? Is it on a low? What sort of, what sort of uh, artifacts I might be able to find? Then you make your preliminary investigation. Then you go out into the field to your ranch. You orientate yourself. Well, which is north? Which is south? How far am I from the, from the highway? You record what you find as evidence. You interpret what you find. And then you present, like me, what has been found. And there are classic forms for that, or you can make your own. I've made my own. These, these uh, did not fit me well. What I do is I use a GPS watch, which records every step that I make. And in this ranch, this is all the area I have walked on. And when I find an artifact, I can punch a button, it drops a pin there electronically. Then I bring this data back to the computer, download it, superimpose it on Google Earth, and you get where you've been and, ah, and where you have found things. And you can use that to correlate, well, maybe because of the concentration here, this might have been a campsite. Not only... Digital photos at the same time? I do take digital photos of what I find as well. Both on the surface, then when I flip it over for the impression of what it, how it has survived on the soil. There's an interesting uh, paper I want to write about the exposure of an of a artifact to the sunlight. Because I've noticed that when I use a ultraviolet light on points and artifacts that I have found, one side will fluoresce more than the other side. What I didn't do is I didn't mark which side it was up. But I could, might go back to the photographs and do that. But I'm doing that from now on. <laughs> so, as I said, it gives you an idea what is there, where uh, you haven't been. So you don't cross over too many times. Although if you look at that, it looks like I've really concentrated in this area and found nothing. A lot of concentration in this area, found very little. There are some of these long lines like this some dark, some light. Those are areas where the farmer has root plowed the land. And if you look at the concentration of points or artifacts, very few are found in these white areas because they've been turned over and buried again. Try to look on property that has not been root plowed. Although root plowing is fine because the artifacts that were two feet underground or a foot underground may have been turned over and now you can see them. And this is the way I document what I find. A number that cor correlates with the point that uh, my GPS watch has dropped, the latitude and longitude, the date, the ranch I was, at, I was on, this was on the Tigre Chico and the, the Milagro Ranch, and what kind of, of item I found. So it's not all arrowheads. Uh, hand tools, scrapers, fragments even, hand axes, <coughs> blades, and I'll show you some of those in just a minute. Okay, you analyze what you find, you and you distinguish what you find. And now I'm going to go into well, how you tell an arrowhead from a projectile point. Now I've used both terms. You may not be as aware that there are two, two terms, projectile point, Arrowhead. An arrowhead is a projectile point, but 
of certain characteristics. The larger point went on a, longer, a bigger shaft. Because the shaft was bigger, you couldn't put it in an arrow or a bow. So it had to be thrown or la uh, launched with a spear thrower. And these are usually these are usually related to the width of the hafting area where they were placed on the on the shaft and its size, weight, and length. Where the alternate approach is to distinguish an arrow point or an arrowhead by its very small size, its weight, length, and thickness. Now let's talk about arrowheads. Okay. How many arrowheads do you see here? Good question, right? There are probably not a single arrowhead here. Although, although uh, it can be pointed out that, um, that this may be an arrowhead, that may be an arrowhead, and this may be an arrowhead, but this is actually have been, has been reworked so often it's gotten small. Look at the size of these. This is one, two, three, almost four inches long. You can't put that on an arrow. It would overbalance it. This one down here is one and a half, or almost two inches long, and that's probably one of the smaller ones. It's also a projectile point, and I'll show you what our difference is in a minute. Okay? How many arrowheads are here? Probably all of them are. Look at the size. This one's one, maybe maybe two inches, and this may may not be an arrowhead, true, but it could be. That's also one of the large ones, that's why I've put them on this side. But everything else is an inch, or maybe smaller, or at least a, one and a half inches or smaller. They're also very thin, very lightweight, so they don't overbalance the arrow. Down, uh, down here is the smallest arrowhead I've ever found. You can look at that, that's 11 millimeters in width. That, that's small. And you go, well, how, what were they shooting with this? They shot anything they could. Something like this penetrating even a deer would render it dead after a while. And of course, they would probably shoot other smaller animals, rabbits, squirrels, if there were squirrels here, we don't know. Nonetheless, Arrowheads are very unique when you talk about, well, let's go look for arrowheads. What you're actually looking is, let's go look for projectile points. And my idea is, let's go look for artifacts. And here is the difference shown in graphic detail. You get the big points on big shafts, little points on small shafts. Now, these, uh, these two are reproductions by a company called Hereford Company here in Texas. I bought the, uh, the, the dark points and the, and the points from him. And then these over here are points I made to fit in small little uh, replicas, and not good replicas of what the arrows may have been. The spears were shot or launched from this device called an atlatl. And the spear, you can see how long that one is. This was about six feet long. That's why you needed to have a heavy point so that it balanced the, uh, the shaft and it made a tremendous impression once it was stuck in something. Okay. And I'm going to move over here for a second because I'd like to show what a dart would have looked like. And you can see that the, the projectile point is here. It's kind of interesting though. The point pulls out. <coughs> this was a perfect adaptation. When this was launched at an animal and it 
penetrated, this would fall out. And the hunter could go pick this up, get another one he'd already made like this, put it back in, and shoot the animal again. <coughs> that made it very efficient. Because if you left this, this would break. And how long do you think it took to make this compared to just making that part? This is the launcher or the atlatl held in the hand like this. It fits into a little pocket there, held like this, <coughs> and then launched. It gives you a much higher reach and can be thrown with higher velocity. Arrow can go, or the point can go further, strike with more force, and travel further. So how far could they travel? Throw it. 200 feet. Wow. And <clears throat> this gave them an advantage. Looks like my... Um, all, oh no, here's one that still has the feathers on it. <coughs> this would have been the size of a possible arrowhead or an arrow. And again, a removable point. That is just a little piece of wood. But they would fit them in. Then they could launch that. This part would go into the animal, fall off, and this could be thrown again. That's a little dove feather I put in there. Differences between dart points and arrowheads. Very important. And look at the, the varying sizes. The, um, the atlatl, throw, the throw stick, the dart and the dart points, and the arrows down here. And this is also a, a reproduction of a, a light bow that may have been used down here. Now realize that South Texas did not have the long bows that some of you may be familiar with of European manufacture. Therefore, the, the arrows were smaller. The arrow point had to be smaller as well. What other tools can be found out there? Not just arrowheads or, or dart points. And here they range from knives and cutters, scrapers, adds and celts, gravers, banner stones, perforators, abrading stones, gouges, hammer stones, gorgets, axe and hand axes, metates, molcajetes, mortars, manos, tecolotes, pestles, ornamental items, and a whole lot more. There's a lot of things out there that most people aren't aware of. Pick them up, document them, because they can be very useful. I was fortunate enough to collaborate with another uh, longtime collector and, and one of the uh, most astute uh, archaeologists of the area, even though he's self-taught. And we collaborated in writing papers on, a, on tools that we find down here. Knives. You could tell, generally tell a knife from a projectile point because there's usually a very high angle crescent edge. You can see both of those have that crescent edge. Now mind you, these could also be used as projectile points or even knives or, or blades <laughs> or whatever, but it's slightly different in geometry. I did some reproductions. This is a reproduction of a knife without a tip, you realize, that is very similar to one that was found on the man that was found in ice, in European, the ice man. So that's what they use, a little piece of stick, antler, bone, hafted, well, a tool, a utensil, a tool, and made it knives and daggers. Here are pictures of other tools, things that you may have thrown away. Perforators made for cutting holes in leather, in, in wood, maybe even in other rocks. You can tell that by the very sharp point. 
Here is another good example of reuse of, of resources. These were probably projectile points at one time that broke, then were refashioned into other tools. Well, there are, these are probably also two drills, and then there are gravers, very tiny little points. Those gravers were used for carving in wood, bone, shell, maybe even for tattooing. Don't know. But if you found this, you'd say, oh, it's just a broken piece of rock with a point on it. However, if you study the edges here, where they've been very carefully napped, that gives you an idea that that is a true artifact. Blades are just very thin pieces of, of rock that have been chipped off of a core, and those were used for blades, for cutting. Larger blades, this is the largest one in the area. Thumb scrapers, things that were little pieces of rock whose edge is rounded, but has a very, very sharp edge that we use for, for either taking the meat off hides, for tenderizing things, for carving into wood, for shaping things, for shaping wood, but scrapers, little ones and larger ones. So, so I've got a question. Yes. So I'm walking around and I'm seeing some of these and I'm seeing how they're, I don't know what the uh, correct word is, but the chipping. Mm -hmm. The chipping. On, them, on the, the large thumb scraper yep. and the middle blade. And I see those and I think to myself, oh, it's a broken rock. Mm-hmm. The likelihood is... Sometimes they are broken rocks. <laughs> is, that is that a typical break? I mean, I, have, no. I can see more... It's not a typical break. Generally, in a rock that has been broken naturally, you'll have maybe one break or two breaks. But if you have 5, 10, 15, 100 little breaks, that can't be natural. And that's one of the key issues. Even if it's smooth on one side, like it looks like it's whole, and then... Ah. Let's look at some of those that you just described. Hand axes and tools, rounded edges on one side, sharpened or f worked on the other side. Different shapes, different sizes, different orientations to the tips. These are flat, almost flat. This has got a curve. Flat, 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 cur slightly curved. And these two are, are Unknowns. We don't know what they use these for. They may have been cores or preforms for something they were going to build, but never got around to it. <laughs> never got around to it. Haha. <laughs> Abrading tools or braiders. Rocks that have grooves in them that were formed by the movement of either bone, wood, or antler to sharpen them and are now discarded. Gorgets, pendants, if you don't mind. Pendants, my collaborator and I wrote a paper about these pendants that were found in South Texas. We have an artist in, the, in our group that actually recreates pendants made off, out of shell and, uh, and other materials. Pretty neat. And shell beads, you can find these out in the open too. Not often, but these are the only two I've ever found. So, recreating tools. Finding a tool that is the right shape, or making one that's the right shape, cutting it, hafting it into a piece of wood, transforms it into a scraper for reaching in. So, they may not have been held by the hand, although they could have. They were almost always hafted into a piece of wood, so that they could have more uh, force and more precision. And quite often you'll find these scrapers with the perfect edge on one side and just broken off right of the, flat broken off. For a long time I thought, well, it's just the way they made them. But no, they were hafted into a piece of wood and it broke right there, right at the hafting. And it just seemed obvious after the, I, I realized that, and you see them all over the place. So yeah, these, this is not a complete tool, but it was a tool at one time. Hand axes. Down here, there were very, very few polished axes, such as those that you see in the movies, in a, in a tomahawk or something. What the locals or the inhabitants used was just a rock that they broke 
in half and then chipped away in large chips. So these aren't fine chips, these are large breaks, but they still made a very sharp point. They held them in their hand and they used them as axes for mainly, I would think, to break apart bone to get at the marrow on the inside, but they could also have been used for cutting large slabs of meat, slicing it with force. And there are so many of these, they're just everywhere. No one has ever really been picking these up. And to illustrate, I have buckets full of these. When I started picking them up, and I showed them to my colleague who'd been collecting projectile points for 40 years, he said, really? And then he started collecting them too. <laughs> and I go, oh man, I, was, I wanted that one. <laughs> grinding stones, a mano. The mano is the, the, the Spanish name for a grinding stone. This is one found uh, uh, in Zapata. No, actually it was, it was, well, it was found in Lapino, if you know where that is, that's between Zapata and uh, Roma. You can see, look at the edge of that one. Perfectly ground, flat. And that's out here for exhibit. This is a uh, molcajete on the, on the left and grinding stones in, in bedrock on the right. Now these grinding stones were just holes that, that, that were used for grinding things. They use a long pole of wood instead of a, a rock pencil. And they would pound these things into a, a mash. I recently read the account of Cabeza de Vaca and his, his, uh, his landing or his, his sunken ship and, and abandonment on, on the coast of Galveston in that area and his travels through Texas and finding being well, surviving with the locals there and the ancients, and they having these holes where they would pine, they would grind nuts or berries. And interestingly enough, they would add soil to them. And that's what they would eat. Yes? Can I ask, where was the picture taken on the right? There aren't loads of rocky outcrops like that. That's true. The only place you can find them are further west. This was found north of Escobares. Yes. We were very lucky to, uh, to be able to get in this area before it became also a wildlife refuge. Nonetheless, there's, a, there's papers written about that too. You can see how deep, how deep they are. This guy's hand is that far into it. <laughs> well, we'd already run sticks down into them <laughs> and flashlights and everything else. But one of the interesting points here, see these little marks? Did you see these earlier? In the abrading stones. These, this was also be used for spears and sharpening their points. More than likely. Or they were trying to expand that hole. Who you knows? It's just unknown. Okay, so this is what a happy amateur geol uh, archaeologist looks like after a day of collecting artifacts. Yes? You mentioned that they would throw dirt. Yeah. Why? Minerals in the soil. The, uh, there's accounts of uh, locals living in and around Sol del Rey. They went there to get the salt. You have to have salt in your, in your system. You have to have that electrolyte. Also, as well as, as finding game and finding, you can't drink that water, it's too salty. But you can see, look at all the things he has found, from hand axes to the better points down here. As well as many other things that probably aren't artifacts. But he brings them back anyway, just in case. Okay, so... In conclusion, the amateur archaeologist is best when he details and records. Okay. Thank you to the Mission uh, Museum. And I'd like to end with this one slide that illustrates the programs at the university that are dedicated to the preservation of the, the ancient history that's here. Not just of the 
of the ancients, but also of the settlers in the area. They go out and interview landowners and write about their history, about the history here. If you guys, any of you have ideas about projects that their students might be interested in about um, re most recent history, you can contact them, the CHAPS program, which is the Community Historical Archaeological Project with, with Schools. Thank you.